Well, good morning. Welcome to Lake Bourne Baptist Church. So glad that you are here with us today, especially those of you joining us online. It's always a joy when we get to gather together, but today we get to celebrate even more baptisms than we saw last week. So we'll be getting to that in just a few moments, but a couple of quick of announcements I want to make you aware of. Number one, we're in a process right now of signing up for a local mission trip at the end of July, the 26th through the 29th. This is our local family mission trip called Beyond the 404. So if you want more information about that, you can sign up and get information at Church Center. Also, a part of that ministry is filling backpacks that'll be handed out during that mission trip. And so if you can't be a part of the mission trip, but you want to give some of the supplies, you can bring them here to the church, or you can go to a list on Amazon and donate that way. And you can go to lakebornebaptist.com backslash backpack to get more information about that. And then a word to our men, the Upstate Men's Conference is coming up at the end of August over at First Baptist Simpsonville. So I want to encourage you men to sign up over on Church Center to be a part of that as well. This time I'm going to ask Michelle Grigg if she will come join me up on stage. Uh, for those of you that may be newer to our church, Michelle serves as the leader for our nursery ministry. And today we're recognizing and celebrating Michelle because today is a very special day as we celebrate 25 years of serving in that capacity. So Miss Michelle, just a, another gift for you to let you know how much your church family loves you and we appreciate you. And uh, we'll let you go back over there with Miss Lena because Michelle hates to be on stage and she's not going to speak other than saying, thank you, thank you. So uh, we're going to begin this morning with our children leading us in a very special time. So pray that today will be a blessing in your life as we gather together. Would everybody please stand? Our colors this morning are being presented by Senior Airman Blair Nodine, United States Air Force. Now please join us and our children as we sing our national anthem. join in on our pledge to our flag. Attention, salute, and pledge. I, I pledge, pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic, republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Amen. Let's give God a round of applause for this wonderful country that we're able to live in. Now, if you direct your attention to the baptistry pool, we have several baptisms this morning. You may be seated. Well, good morning, Lake Bowen. It's a pleasure to be with you guys again this morning. And we have another one of our students uh, who gave their life to Christ at Fuge last week. This is Will Green. And Will actually has a twin brother, so it was kind of hard this morning trying to figure out which one I was supposed to have up here. Uh, but I'm pretty sure I got the right one. Um, anyhow, 
on the very first night of Fuge uh, two weeks ago, Will stands up at the invitation and makes eye contact with me and says, hey, I need, I need to talk. And so we quickly went outside of the auditorium and he explained to me that, that he needed to accept Christ as Savior. He wanted to follow Jesus. And so he prayed to receive Christ that night and he comes this morning to take his next step after his new life in Christ in baptism. So Will, upon your profession of faith in Jesus, I baptize you, my brother, in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, buried in the likeness of his death and raised to walk in newness of life. Well, as many of you know, last week was Vacation Bible School here at Lake Bourne Baptist Church, and we had several children that made professions of faith, the first of which is Miss Emily Clark. Emily came down during the visitation or the invitation time during Vacation Bible School, and one of our leaders prayed with her, and Emily put her faith and trust in Jesus as her Lord and Savior. And Emily is here today with her mom up here watching and her family watching down below, and some of her family probably watching online to let everyone know that she's a follower of Jesus. So Emily, upon your profession and faith in Jesus as your Lord and Savior, I baptize you, my little sister, in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. Emily, you're buried in likeness of his death. Emily, you're raised to walk in newness of life. Next is Miss Charlotte Phillips. Charlotte also came down during the invitation time and she spoke with Miss Lena. And then the next night when she came back, she spoke once again with Miss Haley and affirmed that she had placed her faith and trust in Jesus also. And so Charlotte, upon your profession of faith in Jesus as your Lord and Savior, I baptize you, my little sister, in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. Charlotte, you're buried in the likeness of his death. Charlotte, you're raised to walk in newness of life. <laughs> Next is Miss Miranda Murphy. Miranda came to Vacation Bible School this year, and on one of the nights she was here, she was speaking with Miss Brittany Clark and talked about how she wanted to be baptized. And Brittany said, well, in order for you to be baptized, you have to put your trust in Jesus. The very next night, one of the songs that they sung about was the ABCs of, of admitting that you're a sinner, believing in Jesus, and confessing Him as your Savior. And she did that at that time. So Miranda, upon your profession and faith in Jesus as your Lord and Savior, I baptize you, my little sister, in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. Miranda, you're buried in likeness of his death. Miranda, you're raised to walk in newness of life. Miranda was coming to be baptized this morning and her sister Mariah came with her also. And when she got to the office, she says, I wanna be baptized too. And so we began to talk about Mariah's testimony. And two weeks ago, she was at the Vacation Bible School at Northbrook and placed her faith and trust in Jesus also. So Mariah, upon your profession and faith in Jesus as your Lord and Savior, I baptize you, my sister, in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. Mariah, you're buried in likeness of his death. Mariah, you're raised to walk in newness of life. Next is Miss Elena Harris. This morning during the nine o'clock service, Elena and her family came to be a part of our church family and I got to meet with them a few days ago and found out about Elena's time just a few days ago that she placed her faith and trust in Jesus also. So Elena, upon your profession of faith, I baptize you, my little sister, in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. Elena, you're buried in likeness of his death. Elena, you're raised to walk in newness of life. At this time, I'm gonna be joined in the baptistry with two special ladies. The first of which is Miss Haley Elrod. Uh, many of you know Haley is a part of our church family. And for the last two summers, she has served as one of our youth interns with the youth ministry here at the church. The second lady that's gonna be joining her is her cousin, Amber. Amber Reed, two weeks ago, was attending one of our services. And during the invitation time, she came forward and spoke with my wife, Haley. And during the invitation time, Amber placed her faith and trust as Jesus as her savior. And she requested that because her cousin Haley had played such a large role in her life, she wanted Haley to be a part of her baptismal this morning. So Haley. Upon your profession of faith in Jesus Christ as our 
and Lord and Savior, my cousin and my sister in Christ, in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, I baptize you in the likeness of his death and raised in the likeness of his life. Amen. The amazing thing is that when you look at the Great Commission, where Jesus says that we are to go into all the world to make disciples and to baptize them, to teach them to believe all things, that's the command for all of us as Christ followers. It's always exciting when the Holy Spirit allows us to have the people that God used in a person's life for them to take that next step, to be a part of them taking their next step after salvation. At this time, we're gonna continue with our worship time. If you would stand together. Today is the first Sunday of the month, which means it's our special dollar offering that goes to help ministries in our area or families that are in need. So as Pastor Christopher leads us, once the music begins, you come and place your gift down in the church offering below. God bless you. Freedom is not free. It was bought with a price because of those who were willing to freely give. But there's another who freely gave. And he bought our salvation with a price. Let's praise him, the son of suffering. Oh, the perfect Son of God in all His innocence. You're walking in the dirt with you and me. He knows what living is. He's acquainted with our grief. A man of sorrow, son of suffering. Oh, blood and tears, how can it be? There's a God who weeps, there's a God who bleeds. Oh, praise the one who would reach for me. Hallelujah to the sun. To the sin of you were graced, and the broken you embraced. And in the end, the proof is in your words.
church there was a line that we were just singing your cross is my freedom your stripes my healing I'll praise King Jesus it's my prayer that's your story that your freedom the freedom that we get to celebrate to be here and worship freely and live freely it's because of the cross it's because of the son of suffering so as we go into this time of prayer I want us to turn our hearts to the gift of freedom, that gift of salvation that gives us a chance to speak freely to our Heavenly Father. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we are grateful always for a chance to gather in your house and sing praises to you because you loved us so much to send your Son to become the Son of suffering, that he would die so that we have freedom. We have the freedom from our sin, from our guilt, Lord, from all that life can throw at us. And although we may see chaos and hurt and hardship in our world, Lord, we know that's temporary. And that our freedom in you, it's eternal, it's forever. And Father, we stand here grateful for that, humbled by that gift. Lord, I pray this morning that as your word is open and spoken, Lord, that you will speak to our hearts. You will just remind us of how good you are. Lord, you will speak to us in love, but also in truth. Lord, share with us what we need to hear so that we can become who you want us to become. Lord, we celebrate so many things this morning, this great week we've had at VBS and the lives that were changed. Lord, those that came forward to express their desire for salvation, Lord, and all the seeds that were planted, Lord, you are moving and working in the lives of those children and, of course, the workers. Lord, we celebrate these baptisms Lord, these incredible moments that you allow us to be part of, we share together. But Lord, let us not forget, ultimately, it is you who is worthy of our praise. So this morning, as we continue through our worship time, Lord, may our praise reach you. Lord, may your presence be be known and felt and welcome here in this place. And Lord, continue to speak to us. But all glory and praise to you, King Jesus, for us in your name we pray. Amen. Only one spoke out 
found the stars a place Only one could breathe life into clay Only one can quiet raging seas Only one has power to Sing that with us.
you got a copy of God's Word with you, turn to Matthew chapter 21 as we continue our series on the questions of Jesus. If you're a first-time guest or haven't been with us in a while, for the last several weeks we've been working our way through the Gospel of Matthew, looking at some of the specific questions that Jesus asked during his ministry. A couple of the questions we looked at was a few weeks ago, we looked at the concept where Jesus says to his disciples, how many loaves do you have? And in that time together, we talked about how you and I don't walk around with loaves of bread, but we do walk around with gifts and talents and abilities. And what God wants to know from us is when it comes to our gifts, talents, and abilities, how many loaves do we have? And that word loaves stood for how much love, obedience, availability, vision, encouragement, and strength. How much of those things do you have when it comes to using those things for the glory of God? Last week when we were together, we looked at where Jesus posed the question, what will it profit? And as we were together last week, we talked about how that is the self-examining question that each of us must answer about our life. That Jesus says that if a man lives his whole life, he gains everything this world has to offer, but at the end of his life, he forfeits his own soul. The only thing that he possesses that will last for all of eternity then at the end of life, he, in essence, loses the game of life. We talked about how, as we were preparing last Sunday for Vacation Bible School, about how following Jesus changes the game, and how if you use the euphemism of our life being like a game that we're playing, then truly following Jesus changes the game, because it changes the trajectory of our life. It changes the value standard that we use in our life. I mean, it literally changes our life. And in so doing, it changes the game. Last week, we were just overwhelmed by the number of children that came. We had an average of almost 300 children Sunday night, Monday night, Tuesday night, Wednesday night, Thursday night. And each night, we averaged over 200 volunteers that came to, after a long day of work, to come in to put a long night's work of service using those gifts, talents, and abilities that they had for the glory of God. And because of their sacrifice, because of you that prayed for the Vacation Bible School week, we saw 18 children place their faith in Christ last week on Tuesday night and the nights that followed. We already have one of those young girls scheduled for baptism the week after next. And as we continue to talk with those young people and their parents to make sure they truly understand what it means to put their faith and trust in Jesus, week after week, you're going to be taking the opportunity to see them take those next steps. Today, as we're in Matthew's gospel, chapter number 21, we are now entering into the Passion Week. For those of you that may not know what the Passion Week is, this is the final week of Jesus's life. He's made the triumphal entry into Jerusalem where thousands of people have gathered. And they've all shouted, Hosanna, Hosanna, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. They've, they've laid coats down for him to walk upon. They've waved palm branches. All this pomp and circumstance has been taking place. And as all of these people are celebrating Jesus of Nazareth coming for Passover week. We see there's another group that is also taking notice of Jesus being there. It's the religious leaders of his day the scribes, the Pharisees, the elders, the chief priest. Jesus has this amazing ability throughout the three plus years of his ministry to teach his disciples through what we call parables, to give an earthly story with a heavenly meaning. That for those that had ears to hear what he was saying, they would hear the story, the parable, and they would say, oh, okay, I understand what he's talking about. But for those that were far from God, it was almost as if there were ear buffs put over their ears and they couldn't hear. There were blinders put over their eyes and they couldn't see. There was this veil that kept them from seeing and understanding what Jesus was talking about. Today, as we look at our question for this week, the question we're going to be looking at is one that Jesus posed to those chief scribes, those chief religious leaders, those elders, the chief priests that were gathered together that week. And he's going to ask them a question, but what do you say? It's one of those questions that in life, we, we oftentimes will, will have a scenario where someone will ask for our opinion. They'll ask for our opinion, and by so doing, what they're asking is, what do you say? What do you think about this situation, this scenario? And for this scenario today, Jesus is going to, on the front end, give the question, what do you say? And then he's going to give them the parable. And as he's given the parable, as he's revealing more and more in this earthly story that has this heavenly meaning... At the end, he's going to pose yet another question to those that were there, those chief priests and those scribes. 
We're going to begin reading in chapter 21 of the Gospel of Matthew with verse number 28. Hopefully you found your way there, and if you're ready for God's Word, let me hear you say, I am. We begin with that question, what do you think? There was a man who had two sons, and he came to the first and said, son, go and work in the vineyard today. So the parable setting is set in motion. Jesus begins by saying that there is a father that has two sons. Now, most scholars and theologians believe that when he says he came to the first son, he actually was coming to the youngest and not the eldest. The reason why they believe he was probably coming to the youngest is because what he asked him to do was a physical labor type work. Go work in the vineyard. Because of the hierarchy and the standing within the family unit, the, the older son would have had more of an authoritative role. He would have had more of a, an administrative role, if you will. And so as his father comes to that first son, he gives very clear instructions, son, go and work in the vineyard today. And on the front end of that verse, Jesus poses the question, what do you think? So put yourself in the mind of those chief priests, those elders at this time. This man from Galilee, this Jesus of Nazareth that you've been hearing about for three years, performing all of these miracles and all of these benevolent acts taking place, now he's there in your presence. For some of them, they had seen him before. For some of them, they had heard about him before. But now, he's right there in front of them. He says, okay, you religious leaders, you religious elite, what do you think? There's a father that's got two sons. He comes to the first one. He says, son, go and work in the vineyard today. Verse number 29, the son answered, I will not. But afterward, he regretted it and changed his mind, and he went. Now, I don't know how many of you in your, in your work scenario that you work in, how many of you may have a little bit of leadership authority. Because of your position, there are people that, that you basically can tell them, hey, I need you to go do something, and they have to do it because you're over them. In this parable, the father clearly is over the son. And he gives him a very clear instruction. This is what I want you to do. Go and work in the vineyard. And the young son says, I will not or no. I don't know how many of you have ever had coworkers that have done that to you. Or, or maybe you've been in a place of authority and there was a need known, opportunity given, and you were made aware of it and you thought that somebody else would take care of it, but they did not. This past week during vacation Bible school, I was making my way through the foyer and one of our safety guys said, uh, hey, preacher, he let you know one of the kids gave back the food they just ate right down here at the front where Joe, your feet are right there where it happened, brother. And I said, well, brother, I need knows an opportunity given. I ain't cleaning up that puke. So I go and I get the stuff and I get down and I clean it up because, I mean, I've raised kids. I've been at vacation Bible school. I mean, I, I know how this process works. You can't leave it. You can't look at it. You got to do something. You got to clean it up. Years ago, before I went to to own to go to North Greenville to get my education. I was working at Waldrop Hegan Air and, and I didn't have anybody that I was seeing in a relationship, so I had a lot of free time. So I decided that I would get a second job. My second job was being a pizza delivery man. I mean, some of you from Emmon that have been here for a while, you may remember when Michelangelo's Pizza was there on Asheville Highway. Well, I was a pizza delivery guy. I'd go work eight or nine hours at Waldrop's and then I'd go do a shift at night and make a little extra money. Well, the gas prices started getting a little bit higher. And my dad had a Mazda B2000 long bed, five speed pickup truck that got great gas mileage. And so I started driving my dad's truck to do pizza delivery. Well, we had a promotion going on that like a lot of places at that time, place your order 30 minutes or less or it's free. So I get to order and it's, it's over at the Lake Cooley over there. And so I get to order, put it in the truck. I drive out to the guy's house, ring the doorbell, hi, I'm from Michelangelo's. I'm your pizza delivery guy, Brad. Here's your pizza. He says, where's my two liter Coke? I looked at the receipt. I said, sir, there's no two liter Coke on the receipt. I ordered a two liter Coke. Well, you know, I learned a long time ago, the customer's always right. Even when they're wrong, I mean, the customer's always right. So I said, well, sir, here's your pizza. I'll be right back. So I go back to Michelangelo's. I get back 33 minutes from the time of his order till I get back with that Coke. Sir, hi, Brad, Michelangelo's, I got your Coke. That'll be X amount of dollars. No, promotion says 30 minutes or less, so it's free. You're right. Sir, do I get a tip? Because I'm thinking, I mean, I brought you your pizza, made another trip back, brought you a two-liter Coke. He said, yeah, I got a tip for you. Next time you come, don't forget the Coke. <laughs> Slam the door. I go back and I share the story with my manager. There's nothing he could do. Basically, I made a dollar 
for delivering that pizza because that was the rate I was paid at. The next day I come into work, my manager says, hey, Brad, we need you to make pizza boxes. I ain't making no pizza boxes. In essence, what I said to the one that was in authority over me, no, I will not. But then after a few minutes, I started thinking, you know what? This guy's letting me work these shifts. I make pretty good when people tip me and I just need to go make some pizza boxes. Because in my mind, I started doing the math. If there's no pizza boxes, you can't put pizza in the boxes that don't exist, and I can't deliver the boxes with pizza in them if the boxes aren't there for the pizza to go in them for me to deliver them. So I went and made pizza boxes. I mean, it's almost like this son. If you look at it, what does it say? He says, but afterward, he regretted it, and he changed his mind, and he went. Now, when we look at this first son, we see that there was a rebellion, a realization, and a realigning that took place in his life. Look with me at what it says. It says, the rebellion, I will not. Not, I do not know what you're asking me to do. Not, I do not understand what you're requiring me. Just a flat out no to what the father asked him. Now, we don't know what the time process was, but it says that inevitably, it says afterward he regretted it. There was this realization that takes place. That aha moment. You know what? The father sure has been good to me. My father has always taken care of my needs. Now, I may not have always got my wants, but he's really taken care of me, and I really should do what he's asked of me. Why did I rebel against what he requested? And then there's the realigning. He changed his mind, and he went. In essence, this young son said, I need to get my act together. I need to stop acting this way. I need to realign my heart and mind See, years before this parable is given, Jesus gave another parable about another father and two other sons. It's the parable we know as the prodigal son. Where the younger son takes his inheritance, he goes out and he wastes all of the money, but then there's the moment of where he has that aha moment of realization that what he's doing is not right. And he says, I will arise and go to my father's house and I will say to him, I'm no longer fit to be called your son. Just let me be a servant. And for those of you who know the story, you know that when he gets to the father, the father runs and embraces him and welcomes him back in, all because there had been this realigning of his thought process. There had been a realization about the decisions he was making over the rebellion that had taken place. You know, so many times in our life, the way the world works with us, there needs to be that realigning that takes place. We begin to act almost like the man from last week, the, the man that gains the whole world Everything the world has to offer him, fame, folly, and fortune. And then at the end of his life, it's all squandered because he has nothing. And he goes out into an eternity lost and separated from God. In Romans chapter 12, verse number 2, it says, Do not be conformed to the world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. The transforming of the renewing of our mind takes place when we allow the word of God to wash over us. When we submit ourselves to those of spiritual authority over us. And we allow the Holy Spirit to lead God and direct us. This is the picture we see being painted out with the first son. But then because the son says no, the father not knowing that he repented and actually went and did the work, the continuation of the peril in verse number 30, Jesus says, then the man came to the second son. Again, most scholars and theologians believe this is probably the older son of the two. He goes to the second son and said the same thing. Son, go and work in the vineyard today. And when he says the same thing to this son, he replied, I will, sir, But he did not go. I want you to think about the response for just a moment. I will, sir. Not I will, dad. I will, daddy. I will, diddy. I mean, whatever the pet name the child may have for his father, it's I will, sir. But look at what it says. He said, I will, sir. But he did not go. You see, with the first son, there's the rebellion, the realization, and the realigning. But with the second son, there's a retort, a rejection, and then the real heart. What is the retort? I will, sir. Saying what he's always said. Saying that which he knows his father wants to hear. Knowing that he's not going to do it. But he says, I will, sir. Basically just parroting what he needs to say. I don't know how many of you have ever had a pet parrot. I remember when I was a young boy growing up, my Aunt Nancy and Uncle Larry had a parrot. And you could go in and that parrot would say, pretty bird, pretty bird. Well, years ago, Haley's dad was pastoring in one of the churches he was the lead pastor at. And there was a lady in the community that would continually call the church. 
On the day that she called the church, Mitch was out doing something with the church or out making a visit, and she called in, and the church secretary answered the phone, and she said, is the pastor in? The secretary responded, I'm sorry, he's not in. Click, a woman hung up on her. About five, ten minutes later, phone rings again. She answers the phone. Is the pastor in? I'm sorry, he's not in. Click. Hang, I mean, just boom, boom, just hanging up. As quick as she says, I'm sorry, he's not in. About 10 minutes later, goes by, the phone rings again. Now, this is back before caller ID, but she probably had a good idea who it was that was calling. She answers the phone, and sure enough, the same lady for the third time says, is the pastor in? She says, I'm sorry, he's not in. She didn't hang up this time. She said, can I ask you a question? Kind of took her back for a little bit. She said, well, sure, you can ask me a question. She said, when your mother was pregnant and carrying you, was she scared by a parrot? Because all you can say is, I'm sorry he's not in. I'm sorry he's not in. I'm sorry he's not in. You know, there are some people that we interact with in life that they might as well just be a parrot. You know what they're going to say before you even begin talking to them. You know that they're just going to give you lip service, if you will. This second son, knowing what the father wanted him to do, because he said the same thing he said to the first son, instead of being obedient, there's this retort of, I will, sir. But then there's also the rejection. But he did not. The sad reality for this son was that he did not understand what the father wanted him to do. It was very clear. Son, go and work in the vineyard today. He knew what he was asked to do. He just didn't do it. But then there's also the real heart He did not go. Since he understood the only thing he went through was just the motions, there was no obedience that was there because his heart was only on lip service and not the heart of a servant. And see, right now, the chief priests and scribes, as they're hearing this parable, they're listening to it. And in the back of their mind, Jesus has asked the question, what do you think? And they're hearing this story and they don't even realize that Jesus is talking about them. The second son that gave lip service was a picture of the religious leaders of the day that lived in the should have, could have, and would have mindset. That he would say that I should have done what was asked, but I could have done what was asked, but I would have done what was asked, but, and there was always a but that would follow the should have, could have, and would have. It was almost like, you know, we used to sing the old song, wherever he leads, I'll go. Wherever he leads, I'll go. But for those that fall in the should have, could have, and would have, the I should have, but I know that I've been asked to do this, but I didn't know it was going to be this hard. I could have done it. I I know that I could have taken care of that, but you don't understand. There was something that came up. There was a phone call. There was an invitation that came up, and I, I would have done it, but I know I could have taken care of it. But you see, I just ran out of time. Can I tell you that is quite possibly the lamest excuse you can ever give for disobedience. I ran out of time. 24-7, 365 is what we all get. You get 24 hours a day, seven days a week, 365 days out of the year, unless it's leap year. And for you to know what the Father wants you to do as a Christ follower and to use the excuse, I would have, but I ran out of time, that means you need to learn how to manage your time. You need to learn how to be obedient through being obedient to being stewards of the time of the life that he's given you. This son, we have no idea what his thought process is. We only know for him there was the retort, the rejection, and the real heart that is shown here in his life. Instead of these religious leaders doing what they knew God had called them to do, they were taken in making what Jesus, I mean, what God had established as the religion that would bring men closer to God. They had made it into a religion that drove people further away from God. If you were with us when we went through the Beware the Hypocrite series, Jesus said to those scribes and Pharisees, he says, Beware, you scribes and Pharisees, you hypocrites. You travel great distances to make one proselyte, and in so doing you make him twice as much a son of hell as he was before you encountered him. In other words, what you're doing by putting all of these hoops in front of these people and putting all of this bondage on top of these people, saying this is what God requires, this is what God mandates, when it went outside of what the Word clearly taught, he says, when you have someone that you engage in, they think they're right with God, he said, you've actually made them twice as lost as before they ever met you. And in essence, these men that were religious leaders, there was a second son that said, I will, sir, but they did not go, I will, God, but they did not do what was required of him. They basically had made a promise to God they didn't keep. Solomon in his wisdom in Ecclesiastes 5, 5, he says, for it's better to not make a vow to God than to make a vow to God and not keep it. 
It's better to never say you'll do something than to say you'll do it and not follow through with it. It's better to not make a vow or a covenant with someone and then break it or fall back away from it, is what Solomon is saying. Far too many professed Christ followers are living their lives just as the second son did. They'll give God the Father all the lip service in the world. Wherever you lead, I'll go. But I didn't know you was going to call me to go there. Wherever you lead, I'll go, but I didn't know it was going to require me to have to do that. Wherever you lead, I'll go, but I didn't know I was going to have to step away from this. And at the end of their life, they come down to the end of their life with the regret of should have, could have, and would have. I should have been obedient. I could have been obedient. I would have been obedient. But at the end of their life, the disobedience is greater than the obedience. If you look back with me in verse number 31, after Jesus has laid out this parable, he says to them, which of the two did the will of the Father? So on the front end, Jesus poses the question, what do you think? And these chief priests and scribes, they were probably thinking, oh, finally, we get to speak. We get to tell this Jesus guy what is really truth. So he lays out the parable, and he says, which of the two did the will of the Father? The chief priests and the elders replied, the first one. And we would look at this parable, and we would say, yes, the first one. Because even though he said no on the front end, he was obedient on the back end. The second one said yes on the front end, but was disobedient and never did it on the back end. And so they said the first one, and Jesus said to them, I assure you, most solemnly say to you, that the tax collectors and the prostitutes will get into the kingdom of God before you. See, this is where the whole dynamic of the parable shifts. This is where the whole realization about the question, what do you think, really hits home. Because when Jesus brings up the concept of tax collectors and prostitutes entering into the kingdom before these religious leaders, I mean, come on, these religious leaders, I mean, they had the look, they had the book, they had the hook. I mean, these guys had the look, they looked the part. I mean, they had the robes, they had the tassels, they had the scribes following behind them. I mean, they had the book, they had the Torah, they had the word of God. I mean, and they had the hook. Hey, if you're going to be right with God, thou shalt not, thou shalt. I mean, they had all of those things. But sadly, they had completely missed it because they were not being obedient to what they had said they would do. I will serve as a priest I will serve as a scribe. I will serve as a Sadducee. I will serve as a Pharisee. I will serve. But then it all became about self-serving. And it still happens today. There are preachers that will have congregations that it really won't be about feeding the sheep. It'll be about fattening the shepherd. You know, we, we celebrated Michelle. 25 years of working in the nursery. We should have gave her a medal. I mean... We gave her a check and some flowers, but I mean, that's service. But there are some preachers that are out there. Now, church, if you really want me to know you love me, you know, I could really use a new truck. I mean, the one I got, it's got 10,000 miles on it, you know. Now, church, if you want me to know you love me, that Harley Davidson sitting down at the shop, you can go get it. And it's ridiculous. This is what's happening in Jesus' day. But it's not about trucks. It's not about motorcycles. It's about pomp and circumstance and seats of honor and having their egos fluffed up. Jesus says you need to understand that the prostitutes and the tax collectors, they're going to get in before you because those were the ones that heeded the message of John. Those are the ones that James would say in James 1, but be doers of the word and not hearers only. I mean, when they heard the message that John preached, they responded by faith. Because look at what Jesus says in verse number 32. For John, talking about John the Baptist, the forerunner of Christ, came to you walking in the way of righteousness. In other words, you had an example in John the Baptist showing you what it meant to truly be a follower of God. He came to you walking in the way of righteousness, and you did not believe him. But the tax collectors did. And the prostitutes did. They believed him. And you, seeing this, seeing that these people, that those people that weren't welcome in the the temple, those people that you didn't think would get into the kingdom of God, he said, you saw what was happening in their life. You saw the life change taking place. But it did not even change your mind afterward. And believe him, accepting what he proclaimed to you. 
See, the indictment that Jesus is laying down to them is that the first son represented those that were outside the Jewish covenant, the Abrahamic covenant, that they were outside the, the Israel nation. They were outside the chosen people of God. But now through the presentation that Jesus presented, those that were far from God, the Gentiles had access to the Father. And they, by faith, responded to the message. And because of their faith, they would be the ones that would enter into heaven before these guys. Not that it would be impossible, because we know that there were some Pharisees that were brought out and brought into a relationship with Christ. But he says, because if you looked at them in that way, you didn't miss what the truth truly was. And when he talks about not just the tax collectors as being sinners and the prostitutes as being sinners, the prostitutes and the harlots, he's not just talking about the physical harlotry of prostitution. He's talking about the spiritual harlotry, the spiritual prostitution of going after the false gods, of embracing what I've called for years the checklist Christianity, that surely I've got to be right with God because I'm checking all of these boxes on the list that I came up with. I got up on Sunday morning, check. I actually used deodorant, check. I combed my hair, check. I stayed awake, check. I came to church, check. I put money in the offering, check. I served in the nursery, check. Whatever it is. And that checklist becomes greater than obedience to the Father when the Father says, this is my will. I want you to go do, and then he fills in the blank. But because you got this checklist, uh, I hear what you're saying, but now that you've added that, there's, there's nine boxes, and I've checked eight out of the nine, so I'm good. No, you're not. Partial disobedience is full disobedience. To him that knows to do good and does not do it, it is sin. James 4, 17. Once you know what the Father wants you to do, you can't plead ignorance. Once you know what God's will is for your life, you can't say, well, I, I would have. I, I guess I could have, and, and really, I guess I should have. Because then at the end of your life, that's not going to be the answer you've got to give. It's got to be that answer of being that obedient son to the Father once you know what he's calling you to do. And see, the beautiful thing is, as we look at this parable, it paints a picture for us the reality that it's not how you start, it's how you finish. And so many times in life, that's true. It's not about how you start, it's how you finish. See, the first son, he started in open rebellion. No, I will not. But then he finished as being obedient to the father. The second son, he started looking good. I mean, he had the look, the book, and the hook. I mean, he was checking all of them boxes. But he finished horrible because he wasn't obedient. See, when it comes to you and your walk of faith, Jesus poses the question to you today, what do you think? Do you think you're the first son or the second son? Do, do you see yourself in the parable? Do you see yourself in the teaching that Jesus has made very clear? You may say, well, pastor, you don't, you don't know what's going on in my life right now. Uh, you don't know the hurt, habit, or hang-up that I'm dealing with right now. Let me remind you, it's not about where you start. It's about where you finish. As Wendy and Pastor Christopher and the team come up for a time of decision, years ago there was a young man that, that had an older brother. He was very gifted. He was a great athlete. He was on the high school basketball team. And he asked the coach, can my little brother come and try out? And the coach had seen the kid playing around in the gym. I mean, basically, he'd become like a gym rat. He said, yeah, he can come and he can try out. And he went through the whole process. And his older brother made the team. But the younger brother didn't. So he started out as a failure because he didn't make the team. But it created a fire inside of him that I'm going to make that coach regret not putting me on the team. And so he began to practice. And he began to practice. And he began to put the practice to work. And he began to do the work. Next year, he made the team. Graduated high school, got a scholarship to play in college. Went through college, got drafted into the NBA. And the young man that started out as a failure that got cut from the high school basketball team will go on to be what many consider to be the greatest of all time, Michael Jordan. See, he finished as the greatest, but he started as the least. These two brothers find themselves in parallel. One starts as the worst, yet he finishes as the best. 
you may have come in here today, you would say, that's me. I, out of these two sons, I'm, so many times I've told God no. So many times it's not that I didn't know and I didn't understand. I knew, I just said, no, I will not. You can finish being obedient. You can finish finding favor with the Father. But then there are some of you, you're the second son. Sir, I will go. Yes, sir, I'm here. But you know your heart's far from him. If there's not a change in your heart, you are not going to finish well. You may have everyone fooled, but you ain't fooling him. See, the reality is when you look at verse number 45, it says, now when the chief priests and the Pharisees heard his parables, they perceived that he was speaking of them. There's some of you on the sound of my voice, no doubt he's speaking to you. What do you think? Let's pray together. Father, as we have spent this time in your word, this has been a time not for people to hear the thoughts or the words of a man, but to clearly hear the voice of your Holy Spirit and what he has to say to us today. To submit ourselves to the authority of your word and let it wash over us. And Father, now is the time that ultimately each of us individually must make a choice. Will we be hearers of the word or will we be doers of the word? Father, help us to be doers. Help us to be obedient so that we might honor you. For it's in Christ's name that we pray together. Amen.